Let me briefly add three more points to fill out the picture of how we in the West help to define uh, Iranian deviancy down. First is what you might call the titillations of the transgressive. The liberal West has been making a fetish of transgression in politics as well as art for many decades as somehow offering a kind of liberation from the taboos of the past, no matter what those taboos might be. In that sense, Ahmadinejad's Holocaust denials amount to a kind of political pornography that, as attractive, um, as, uh, that, that is as attractive to some as it is repulsive to many. Although I should say, in much of the Arab world, it is uh, as attractive to many as it is repulsive to a very few. A second point is our quintessential liberal habit of turning any difference of opinion, no matter how lopsided, into a quote-unquote controversy. That means that even if your opinion is foolish or outrageous, or in fact especially if it's foolish or outrageous, it will be given outsized weight in any description of that particular controversy. Finally, there is the subterranean liberal predilection never entirely dormant in any free society, and often quite active in it, which the late French philosopher Jean-Francois Ravel called the totalitarian temptation. The totalitarian phenomenon, he wrote, quote, is not to be understood without making an allowance for the thesis that some important part of every society consists of people who actively want tyranny, either to exercise it themselves or, much more mysteriously, to submit to it. This is the temptation that explains what might be called accomplice liberalism, the liberalism of those in the West who, at various times, offer themselves as the cheerleaders or apologists of Joseph Stalin, or Mao Zedong, or Ho Chi Minh, or Pol Pot, or even today, Fidel Castro. Noam Chomsky, of course, holds the world record in having apologized for all of them. <laughs> this liberalism is by no means a fringe phenomenon, nor a defunct one. Sometimes we even see it in the op-ed pages of certain metropolitan newspapers, both in New York City and in uh, London and uh, elsewhere. And it is the liberalism uh, whose support the Iranian regime now lies for. Now there's the second part of my story, because it's not just that the West has defined down, uh, has, has defined deviancy down for Ahmadinejad and Iran. At the same time, it is also rapidly defining deviancy up for Israel and for those of us in the West who support Israel. Thus, Israel conducts a war of limited aims and clear self-defense in Gaza after years of non-stop terrorist provocation only to find itself being accused of war crimes and crimes against humanity by the UN's infamous Goldstone Report. Thus, Israel announces a 10-month settlement freeze while Palestinian leaders refuse even to come to the negotiating table, only to find itself being accused of being the one that is obstructing peace efforts. Thus, a mid-level functionary in Israel's interior ministry announces approval of the, four, of the fourth of seven planning stages for housing units in municipal northern Jerusalem, and it sparks a full-blown diplomatic crisis with the American administration, even as the administration continues to make diplomatic overtures toward Iran. A few years ago, when I was editor of the Jerusalem Post, I, I asked the European Union's ambassador to Israel why it was that Israel's occupation of the West Bank and Gaza was the source of non-stop outrage in the West, while Syria's then 26-year occupation of Lebanon went all but unmentioned and unnoticed. I'll never forget his reply. He said that Israelis are, quote, one of us. We expect from Israel more than we expect from Cambodia or Colombia, end quote. Now, at first, that remark struck me as not a little bit racist and also pretty rich. Here was the representative of a continent that, within living memory, had condemned six million Jews to die because they were manifestly not one of us. Yet now he was condemning the behavior of another six million Jews because they were one of us. <laughs> but in the way these things sometimes uh, these things sometimes are, the remark was also unwittingly in 
instructive. Above all, it put me in mind of a comment by the late, great American philosopher Eric Hoffer, who in 1968 tartly observed that, quote, everyone expects the Jews to be the only real Christians in the world. <laughs> this is what anti-Semitism is fundamentally about. This is what distinguishes anti-Semitism from other forms of group hatred. Jews are expected to do better. It is routinely demanded of Jews that they be more moral, more principled, more generous, more impartial, more tolerant, more forgiving of their enemies, more inclined to share, more willing to take risks for peace, and so on. Thank you. The Russians can slaughter some 200,000 Chechens, a fifth of the population of that province, as they did over the past 10 years, and the world barely bats an eyelash. But 35 Palestinians are killed over the same period of time in guerrilla combat conditions or terrorist conditions, and it's universally called or denounced as a genocide. And the reason for that is that Jews are supposed to know better, just as they were supposed to know better when Christ appeared among them 2,000 years ago, and they refused to embrace his gospel. This is the paradigm of satanic evil. It is the evil of God's fallen angel, the evil of people who, unlike those benighted Colombians or Cambodians, commit wickedness not out of ignorance, but in full knowledge and wanton disregard of the good. And so it becomes the common refrain in the West that everything that Israel does is done with malice aforethought. When that mid-level bureaucrat made an ill-timed but basically insignificant announcement about the Jerusalem housing plans, it was universally assumed that it had to have been done with the full connivance of Benjamin Netanyahu himself. The idea that Israel's bureaucracy could be as opaque or incompetent as any other country's being completely out of the question. It is universally assumed that if an Israeli artillery shell should hit a school in Gaza or, or a refugee camp in Lebanon, it had to have been done on purpose. Again, the idea being that no 19-year-old Israeli gunner might actually be capable of hitting the wrong target. It is universally assumed that the only reason that Israel resists pulling out of the West Bank is simple greed for the land of others, strategic considerations about terrain and position being supposedly irrelevant to the invincible Israeli defense force. So it is, um, so it is that there is now something like a working assumption that Israel never simply makes mistakes. It only commits crimes. It is the student for whom only two possible grades are permitted, A plus or F. Having once been the repository of so many great liberal hopes, Jerusalem of gold, the socialist paradise of the Kibbutzim, the perpetual underdog in every fight, it is now the victim of those hopes' inevitable disappointments. Of those for whom everything is expected, nothing is forgiven. And of those for whom nothing is expected, everything is forgiven. So it is with Israel and Iran today. <laughs>